Hi, this is Simon Barker of S. Barker Electrical Limited. I'm going to go through what to expect on an electrical installation condition report. Um, that's whether it's for a landlord, for an insurance company, whether you're buying or selling, or whether you just want peace of mind to get a report done on yours. Um, or the proper reports, the only official way of doing them, which is in the regs, is a certain layout and the software I use is actually on an iPad uh, and I'll produce it on there and then email it on so it's dead neat it's, you know, it takes ages to write them out anyway now the format I'm going to go through and to let, give you an idea of what is useful and what is an absolute waste of time and money now you can get these reports done cheaper but don't. I mean, you'll find that you've got lots of restricted reports, you've got fabricated information, and it's just no use to you or an insurance company if anything was to happen in future. It's just no use at all. So it's a false economy, and I'm going to put that right now. So listen up. Now, first of all, an electrical condition report should be multiple pages and not just one. So mine here, mine is seven pages actually, I'm going to go through them in a bit, but seven pages. Now, if you've got nothing at all, because someone's saying, oh, we'll register it, we'll sort it out later, and you don't get anything at all, that's no use because you've got no proof to be able to pass on to a buyer, uh, or even to prove in a court if anything happened to a tenant or to an insurance company and so on. You've got no proof. If someone knocks something up in Excel, or even worse, does something like this, where it's just all handwritten, and this might sound funny, but I have seen this. I am mocking it here, but you know, I've, I've just drawn something here that says, certificate, all is good, tick. Tick, yes. P.S. It needs a rewire because it is old. Scribble, thank you. Now that was mocking. But you'd be surprised at how many different certificates are along those lines and equally as useful i.e not useful whatsoever so let's go through what it should actually look like and what information is actually on it so that you can make a decision if anything needs doing or you can actually prove that all is good as well so the main things that are on there you've got your address there You've got my details on there as well, which are on the bottom there. You have whether it is satisfactory or unsatisfactory, that's on the bottom. So that's in bold at the bottom. It's all signed off by who did it, and it's satisfactory or unsatisfactory. Now, there's also a purpose of the report as well. So in this case, it's a landlord's safety report. That's just the reason why it was done in the first place. And also, um, it's got the estimated age of the install and things like that. So we, we reckon it was about 29 years. I've been asking the owner and they knew when it was built. I saw some paperwork and uh, some other work got done five years ago. Now this is common as well. So you get some work that was done in the last few years and people say things like, ah, they didn't need to certify it then. They did. But people just aren't. So anyway, the second page of this is the important bit. This is the bit that lists any of the issues. So usually it's page two on the reports that I do. Now it might continue on to another page and even another one if that's the case. And almost always on mine, just to be clear, I do add photos at the end of it. So even though this example one, which is just one I knocked up for this video, is seven pages it would have an eighth page ninth page that would be continuation of these or it would be photos which show clearly what i've mentioned in these points i haven't added any in here because it's not that easy to see but i'll go through some examples of different codes so there's three different codes there's code one that is if something is pretty serious and it's actually a risk and it's actually or, or a danger present that's what it's known as 
I'll give an example in a bit. But C2 or chord 2 is where it's potentially dangerous in the event of something failing that could result in a dangerous situation. A chord 3, this is the most misused one I would say because a chord 3 is actually not unsatisfactory it's just where an improvement is recommended now the regulations change all the time and if something's recommended it's normally because the date in which something was put in something has changed since then and while it would be nice to have it done it's a recommendation because I've noticed that it isn't up to that standard but it doesn't fail it because it was put in before all that happened there's a couple of exceptions like socket with RCD protection and things like that but generally anything that has been changed since the original install year or the when any work was done after that uh, it applies from that point so you could have one chord one or one chord two and that gives a fail if you have none of them no chord ones no chord twos but you have a one or, or thousands of chord threes then it's still satisfactory one of the big things i see is people putting small issues down as a chord one or a chord two when they shouldn't be they should be just a chord three people saying you need a new board I wonder how many people listen to that have heard that one before and saying that um, now you do need it if you do some new work but if someone's just suggesting it from a report saying oh you need a new board uh, you don't necessarily uh, there's some small print and all that but generally if someone's just saying that you need a new board just by looking at it and putting that down it should just be a chord three that one as we'll see in a minute so here we go here's some examples so the first one I've got here, I'll read it out in case you don't see it. The first item, I've got a large gap at the top where the fuse board enters. So that's a common one. You've got a fuse board, and normally at the top, especially on the old wooden ones, you normally have some big holes in here, or actually inside, like there, there's a hole. Now that one can be sorted out because you just put a couple of blanks in. But this one here, and by the way, put some proper blanks in, not these flat ones that just push through. These here, if someone's put a hole in for cable and then say taking that cable out, if you've got a big hole that's about the size of, say, your small finger, that's about the sort of size. Um, you, sorry that's the size on the front and the sides but on the top it's actually a small if a bit of cable can go down it basically a small two and a half mil piece of wire say it's really that tight the tolerance because of the ip rating on the top and ingress of dust and and so on so any big holes on the top they come as chord ones even though they're actually quite easy to solve but they would be noticed as a chord one and next big one that's quite common when I've done inspections is RCD protection so you might have a slightly more modern board that's got breakers in like that I just held up but it might have no RCD protection on the socket circuits and those socket circuits might be near an exit where there's a garden where you would and it's the only one that you would use for outdoor equipment those would generally be a code too because if anything happened with that equipment you wouldn't have an RCD protection and then that would be more likely to give you a shock because it wouldn't cut out as quick. So RCD protection is another big one, that would be a code two. If, now some code three examples. The fuse board not being the latest type. Now that was that big heavy thing I just lifted up there. These things now are all metal with a heavy lid on the front. And that is how they look like now so the, the rcd protection actually you've got a main switch which operates the whole lot that one doesn't trip that one is just an isolator you've got to move it on and off manually 
Now this RCD protects those in that group there, and that one here protects this side. So you've got two lots, it's what you call a dual RCD board. And what you would do with a power on is you press that button, that would trip. If you press that button and that doesn't trip, give someone a call because that should happen every time. Some other common examples, uh, code twos would be the gas supply or the water supply not being bonded. What that is, is the pipe work for the gas and the pipe work for the water at the point of the stop tap close to it or at the point of the solid pipe off coming off the meter or very close to it. They should be bonded which is a metal clamp that goes around and an earth cable goes from that all the way back to the board. No cuts, no joints, straight the way back to the board. That is a common one that people, if you haven't had any work done, that that hadn't been done. Uh, so that one, if you've got an old installation, you would probably expect that one to come up. And again, that's just a matter of running an earth cable in to get you right with that. That zeroes out any potential difference, voltage difference that occurs just naturally between two points of land. So, you know, something over there, something down here in the earth actually induce naturally uh, a voltage difference. So you're basically just evening that out. Some people think it's to protect in the copper working case it becomes live. The likelihood of that is very low and yes it will do that as well but it's more to do with that what you call equipotential. In other words a difference between two points on earth uh, eliminating that out, equalizing that equi being equal potential. So the rest of the report actually, so that's the main page and that's the one you would look at and that's the one that most of the quoting would be done from. So you would quote for the code 1 and code 2 items to get it satisfactory whereas the code 3 items would be optional. Now it's all optional of course, and it's up to you what you do with it but obviously if you've got code 1 and 2 the suggestion is that really you should consider getting them done whether it's by whoever does the report or someone else. Uh, now the next bit is all to do with a supply characteristic, so the incoming supply, whether that is all good, and the earthing. So anything found on these pages here and beyond are all transferred onto that second page. So it's the supply coming in. If there's any issues with this, it's normally down to the electric supplier to come out and sort that out. Also the earthing and you know that bonding that we've already mentioned. The next page. So the next lot actually is all different visual inspection points that I would go through to say yeah that passes that no that doesn't you know what the issues are. There's I mean look there's a whole pages and pages and pages of one, two, three. So there are all the different uh, sections of visual checks and there's a lot of visual and you go around doing a lot of the visual stuff at the start and then power off and you'll open some stuff up and do more. Now when you see me with the meter out which is this thing here with all the leads in obviously to test it. This is a multi-test meter, it does lots of different tests. You can get separate test meters but they take up a lot of space. Mine's a multi one which means that if it breaks I've lost every tester but touch wood. And that's a calibrated tester which gives these results on here. So you've got all the different circuits and then the different the cable sizes the type of protection, in other words the fuse and what have you, uh, the copper results, so whether it's got good earth connection and you know the live on a on a ring bands that it's continuous loop, live, neutral earth, because if it's broken that's not a good thing. Um, and so on. And, and basically an important one called insulation resistance, that's the one that tells you whether your circuit 
where that particular circuit, whichever one it is, is coming to the end of its life. Because as this goes down, it goes down exponential decay. When it gets near a certain uh, reading, that's when it's about, that's when it's gonna cause nuisance tripping on an RCD. So you wouldn't swap a ball over then. But it's also when it's gonna get to that point where some, you know, in the following weeks, months, years, you never know how, how long, depends on the use but it is on its way out and that's an indicator of that that test is good for that and that would be if that was lower beyond the threshold which is lower than one it would be noted on that second sheet as well and then again if there's rcd devices you test them to see how quickly they actually uh trip out uh by using that tester so that's it basically there would be a disclaimer notice on the back and some photos to to demonstrate what you found to actually prove that you have found that and prove some of the reasons as well so any more questions just give me a shout put some comments in there share it with someone who you think will find this useful if you know any landlords office managers musicians they have to get them for venues sorry not musicians i'm thinking of pot tests in there but anyone with an office anyone with a house that they're selling or buying and so on now talking of pat testing i just mentioned it briefly there i do have some bundles and when you get a pat test at the same time as an electrical condition report which you will generally do renting and so on there is a 40 pound discount on that for getting them done at the same time on the same day that's simon barker s barker electric s barker electrical limited thanks very much